Are we on? Good morning, everybody. Blessed, blessed Sunday, the Lord's Day. Joshua's not here. He and his family are out sick. So pray for them, all of you here and out there in the edges and the highways. We ask you to turn to page 95 of the hymnal as I find it. We're going to sing all of the verses. It came upon a midnight clear. I have blessed with Deb up here singing with me. So sing it loud, sing it proud. page for those of us who have hymnals. For others, it's Psalm M94. I'm going to do all the way through. We're going to repeat the last two refrain word, four words uh, on the refrain at the end of first and second verse.
This is one of those days where my lead singer is not here, so we have to fill in, and now my verse reader is not here. She's off with her daughter. Praising the Lord together. So, we are here looking at Isaiah 11. Read first five verses. Second verse is the text verse. Go. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord, and shall make him quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither approve after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked, and righteousness shall be girdled of his loins, shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. That is the word of the Lord. God bless the word of the Lord. Amen. So, the book of Isaiah is a big book. 66 chapters. Same amount of books in the Bible, 66 books. It covers a multitude of issues, mostly the fate of Israel, the bad side of Israel. There's so much prophecy in it. It talks about the good things the Israelites did, but it also talks mostly about the bad things they've done. And with that comes something even worse. What's going to happen to them when a reckoning comes? God's only patient for so long. Amen. He was patient for quite a few years. This was after they came out of Egypt. They didn't learn their lessons because they never taught the next generation. So the next generation didn't know how bad it was to be in bondage, to be imprisoned. But God has a plan. He talks to them all the time. He tells them all the time through prophets. And prophets are killed because prophets tell the good news that the people don't want to hear. You're going to suffer. And he tells them there's hope. Then he explains to them the final stage of it all. So this prophecy that we're going to look at talks about the coming troubles they're going to have, the coming pains they're going to suffer. Then he talks about the shoot. The line of David comes back. A lot of them don't want to believe the Messiah is coming back, but they also think the Messiah is going to wipe away all the problems, and that's not the case. The line of David will come back. Then the line of David will die and be risen again. Then he comes back again. And for us, that's the part we're living for. We're not living for the firstborn. That's important, and that brings us history, and that brings it all together. That's the important piece. But let's look at Isaiah 1, verse 2. This is going to start talking about the prophecy of Jesus. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. That's not just happening back in those days. It's happening now. It's happening now. We look at the news. We look at them taking further liberties with no, no Christianity in church. If you claim to be a Jew nowadays, they're radically against you. They're attacking Jewish people in all areas of the world. Colleges, where you should have open exchange of ideas. They're attacking us in for other countries because we're Christian. 
We can't be together because you know why? We change things. Because we work with God, he changes people. People don't want to change. They want the easy life. They want the evil life. They want to do you, make things easy for themselves. Live life out loud. The mantras are saddening. But God spoke through his prophets then, trying to get his people to recognize their failings. And these messages, God would let them know what will happen to them in the future. But he also told them what they needed to do to prevent that, to repent, to come back to him. And they didn't do that. They disrespected him constantly. They worshiped to other gods. And they never listened. But he let it happen. He let them get taken away in multiple events. There were three swoopings in and capturing and taking. And therefore, his people were taken away, put into other communities, other cultures. Therefore, it just broke down the cultures of, their, of the Jewish faith. It took them generation after generation, 70 years of being away from the worshiping and the praying and the loving of the Lord. So God could reset, restart, rebuild his people. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the word, hold, this word translates. Oh, I'm in and out here. To either see or observe. So behold, pay attention. Look at what's going on. The virgin shall conceive, shall conceive of her son. And shall call his name is God with us. So if you're sitting in that environment, you're suffering, you've been told the Messiah is coming. He's me. He's God. He'll be with you. And everybody's sitting there saying, oh, we ain't got to worry about that. We're just going to do what we do. We're going to live our lives. But yet he comes, doesn't he? Jesus comes. This was six to seven hundred years before Jesus actually came, that it was prophesied that he was going to come. So when somebody says, if you're a believer, oh, you can't believe that fairy tale. There's no truth to that. Historically, there's plenty of truth. Plenty of truth. That's why it's important for us to know who he is and what he's done. Isaiah 9, 6 reads this way. This is before we even get to the verses that I read earlier. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful. Wonderful is broken out into uncomprehensible. My Messiah shall come to us full of wonder. Counselor. Ancient Israel, the counselor was portrayed as a wise king, such as Solomon, giving guidance to his people. Who doesn't think Jesus is the wise counselor? Wisdom comes from Jesus. We talked about that the last time. Wisdom comes from him. The mighty God. That pastor just said it right. Glory. Mighty God. God came down to earth. Jesus. One song said, Heaven came down on Christmas. Heaven came down. Glory filled my soul. Know that song? Deb and I are going to sing it one day. She doesn't know it yet. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul, filled my soul. And at the cross, my Father made me whole, made me whole. My sins are gone away, and my night turns into day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Whew. Sang that at the mission quite a few times. Came to me just two days ago, and I haven't stopped thinking about it. Heaven came down. Glory filled my soul. That work for you? 
If it does, that's why we're here. If it doesn't, it's also why we're here. We're here to enhance your walk with God. We're also here to bring you to God. Help you walk with him by saying and praying for you, saying the right verses, talking about it, teaching it, and then living it. Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father. Now we're at a different point in the message. Isaiah is not talking about Jesus as he came down. Isaiah is talking about Jesus as he comes back. This is the prophecy of Revelation. See this prophecy at the end of Revelation as he gives us peace forever and ever. He didn't come once and only once. He's going to come again because he came to show us how to be like him. God wanted us to know him intimately, so he brought Jesus. Then he lets all these wonderful guys write these stories about him, tell us how he lived, what he did, and how we are all going to change. And then he passed it on to Gentiles after the Jews said, we don't want a part of this. Then he says, look out. My son's done right now. But all these people who are looking for a Messiah to be the warrior Messiah, wait till he comes back. Battles will be fought for us to save us, to save the Jews who didn't come to him. It's going to be amazing. I don't know if we'll be looking down at it. Some of us might be in the fray, but he's going to protect us no matter what. Now we get to Isaiah 11, verse 1 through 5. I'm going to read it again, but I'm going to do some additions while we do it. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and the branch shall grow out of his roots. Jesse was the father of David. Jesse's kingdom lineage was thought to have died out with Solomon and all of his sons. This prophecy signifies a new king. The one promised in Genesis 3, 14, verse 15. It reads this way. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, Eve, and between thy seed, the devil's seed, and her seed, that's Jesus, shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Bruising his heel is his death. Bruising his head is defying death. Go back to verse 2 of Isaiah 11. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The king's ruling attributes to, and this is a good leader I'm talking about, it attributes to wisdom and understanding. It means he can discern the, and, a, and has the ability to distinguish or recognize truth. So when somebody's telling you something and you have a good leader around you, they will be able to break it down and say, this is the truth. I don't trust that person. I don't see what you think they're saying is true. Jesus can cut right through our hearts because he knows us. He can see right to our heart. His, his practical abilities, meaning he has counseling, his powerful counsel, power in his spirit, and his qualities of knowledge and fear, all of these characteristics are of a true leader. Everything that verse 2 speaks about is Jesus. Wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And Hopefully and blessedly, he passes that on to all pastors, all counselors who are of the biblical world, because that's what we need in our counselors. That's, that's what we need in our leaders, someone who will listen to us, who will hear our words, hear our passion, hear our heart, and help us walk through this world better. 
you know, I'm, I'm going to put Mary on the spot. I was downstairs while, well, unfortunately, Luke's funeral was going on, and she was pumping us all full of Jesus. I walked out of there walking on the cloud. She just doesn't realize how powerful it is sometimes. She just does what the calling is. We were all smiling, smiling and just, just happy to be around her, and that's a blessing. And that's what Jesus does to you. He brings to you the, the best out of you. And when you share it like she does, it brings the best out of us. We're blessed to have her in our congregation. And she put her head down so she was ignoring me. No. I love you, sister. And I know you're blessed to be here. And that if we do half of what she does, we're doing well. Doing well. That's what we're called to be, the light. Verses 3 through 5. Shall make him a quick understanding of the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall the judge, shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be girdled with his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Now we're back to the prophecy of end times. He's going to cut through all the noise. He's going to take those who are trying to be righteous. He's going to humble them. He's going to take them out. He's going to bring the poor and the meek up and make them exalted. They're going to be his people. They're going to be the right people in his court. This judgment can go beyond the apparent to the truth of the matter. Judge, the king knows and div the divine principles of right and can apply it in correct judgments. When we know what's right, we understand how to think through things. We understand, okay, if this is the right way to live, then this is how I'm going to live. I'm going to have to find a way to teach others the right way to live. We see now that What's right is wrong, and what's wrong is right. And we have to choose to stick with the right all the time. Even when it means, and it's coming, don't know how soon, but it's coming down the pike. They're starting to monitor our language. They're starting to say, if you don't say these things, we're going we're gonna to punish you for it. If you have Facebook pages or YouTube channels or Instagrams, they're going to mute you. They're going to make it hard for people to hear you, see you, and, and know what you're thinking. It's coming. It all started with COVID, and it's not going away. But if you live right, you don't worry about man. They don't affect you. They scare you a little bit, but they don't affect you. You worry about things because, oh, they'll take away my job. They'll make it hard for me to be existing as a person on this earth. There's always a way. God always finds a way. Every time we think we have challenges, every time... Deb goes to the mission. We, we start with a bunch of people saying, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do the other, and then the shrinking of the crowd of people available. But then it's time we have the right amount of people, the right amount of food. Everything's fine. God shines. People are touched. So don't be afraid to follow the truth. Don't be afraid to be a Christian because the glory comes at the end anyway. Where are you going to be? going to be up there with him. doesn't matter what else happened. Jesus took all of that. You think suffering is bad? Think about how many lashes he took. Think about having nails driven through your hands and your feet. Think about that suffrage. It's not fun. We couldn't handle it, but he did. Let's look at John 1, 1 through 5. When Jesus... Came, just as what John says about him. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and with Him was nothing, not anything made that was made. With Him, nothing else happened. It was just Him. In Him was life. 
and life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehend it not. So Jesus came to bring new light, bring new life to the world, to heal the broken bodies and the, and the broken hearts. He came to find this season that we're focused in on now, on the birth of Jesus, and what he has brought to those of us who believe in him. When connecting with God, this gives you wisdom and peace. Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, is a calming presence for all of us. So if heaven came down and he fills our soul with glory, how do we move through this season then? The season that brings us peace in a lot of ways. But it also helps us remember this. Our Messiah came to help us learn how to be new, ongoing, changing people. We're coming up to an end of a season. Coming up to a new year. But Isaiah 43, 18 through 21 says it well. This is how Jesus says it in his own way. Remember ye not the former things. The former things. That's the past. The past is all of just a day away. Remember not the former things. Neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness, the rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because I will give waters to the wilderness, in the wilderness, the rivers in the desert, to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people have I formed for myself. I shall shew forth my praise. This is the ultimate prophecy. Revelation that earth will become heaven and we will rejoice with him and all the saints that came before us and those who will come after us. He will give us drink. He will take care of us. That's his promise. Always has been his promise. We won't walk this walk alone. We won't live in this turmoil alone. So I want everybody to consider this. He makes all things new. Are we willing to do the same? Are we willing to change the way we think? Are we willing to look in the past, even if it was just five months ago, three months ago, two months ago, three days ago, and look for a new way of doing life? Are we willing to say, I have some unfinished business with some people. And we look at it and we go to them and we talk to them and we hash it out and we ask for forgiveness if it's us. We give forgiveness as if it's them. But we have to look at it from a different perspective. We're not going to just move into 2024 the same way we were now. It has to be evolution of our spirit. It has to be a change that God gives us because we can't walk through life like we were yesterday. We're all flawed people, but we all love the Lord. And if we love the Lord, he's asking us to change daily. That's what picking up the cross daily means. It doesn't mean to just go through an action. It means to be the action. Picking up the cross is a metaphor for you willing to stand tall and trust the Lord and give your life to him. And be the light. Don't be the light that's under the bushel. You have no impact. You have no change value. So you pick up your Bible. You read it. You live it. You become like him. This is a new year coming up. We're celebrating the birth of an amazing man who was God on this earth. And he died for us. He took our sins. He carried our burdens. He didn't even have us born yet, and he was carrying our burdens. He died a very, very painful death. And if we don't look at it as an important thing, 
We don't walk his walk and talk his talk. What was it for? It has impact. It means something. We talked about it in Sunday school. We are the light. Jesus had to go away so we could all do more work for him. So we have to do it every day. In our actions, in our words. How people feel when they walk up next to you. Our peace can be felt by others. They can also feel the turmoil we go through. The suffering we deal with. That's why we have to live the life that Jesus gave us. Jesus wants us to reconcile all our broken relationships. Look at Matthew 6, 12. This is part of that wonderful prayer that he gives and models to his disciples. But 6, 12 says something that's very important that a lot of people just read over and don't think about. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Powerful words. He commands that in his prayer process. We have to pray for forgiveness. We have to pray to forgive others. We have to walk through that. And verse 9 says something even more. Blessed, oh, This is Matthew 5, 7 and 9. I'm sorry. We're at the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. Forgiveness, mercy, all the same thing. If we give out mercy, which was given to us, we forgive and we ask for forgiveness and it's given to us again. That's what we're supposed to do. And I know everyone wants to be called children of God, a child of God. If you don't, we need to talk. But that's why we're here. Ephesians 4.32 tells it again. And be ye kind one to another. Here's my favorite word. Tenderhearted. Tenderhearted. How hard-hearted are we sometimes? I don't want to hear what you have to say. I'm going to do my thing, my way. Tenderhearted allows people to get into you and let you think about what you're thinking. Let you see it from a different point of view and it goes on it says forgiving one another even as God for Christ's sakes has forgiven you forgiven you so no matter what you choose to do God is watching all of our actions he just wants us to be at peace with one another he doesn't want us to battle each other he doesn't want us battling anybody now, he doesn't tell us to roll over and play dead. He wants us to be strong in his will, and that's what girding up the, the loins means, putting on something protective to hold you straight so you can stand against all the, the friction and all the fight. But he also wants you to have compassion because how we act around people matters. So as we celebrate the birth of our leader, Jesus, Let's look as if at it as, as we take the steps. So let's look at it and let's take the steps that will make us new. Make us different. Look in the past. I use a lot of this thinking and it's used in Celebrate Recovery, which we all are recovering from something, believe me. We're all recovering from something. And that's one of their messages. Is you need to look at your life and forgive others and ask for forgiveness. It allows you to wash away a lot of your pains and your frustrations. But let's look at forgiveness. Let's move through the forgiveness part. Let's have tender heartedness. Let's be willing to take some of the responsibility that's ours. God wants us to walk through this period of time with happiness, with joy, with, with peace, so others can say, wow, you all do this all the time? You love the Lord all the time? You're at peace all the time? And most of it. We have our challenges, don't we? 
We struggle. But as James says, count it all as joy to suffer for the Lord. It's all a test. It's all a, it's all a challenge. Back to the text verse. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. When we respect the Lord, that's what fear of the Lord means. And we listen to him. Because when the spirit is in us as you accept Jesus, you understand things every day better and better, more and more. As long as you're opening the book and you're talking to Christian people who, like the example I gave earlier, talks him up all the time, praises him all the time, it, it makes your life different. You different. You think about the people in the past who were mean to you, and you're like, eh, praise the Lord, he gave you me. I have a chance now to one day maybe bump into that person and talk to them differently. I have a chance to move forward in the day and, and, and impact somebody's life with kindness. Just remember, Jesus is coming again. And he wants the best version of us. He doesn't want just the same arrow that was here today. He wants a better version of me. He wants a better version of every one of us. And that's what we're here for. We're here to grow. We're here to give to others, to share with others, to tell others about Jesus. And this relationship with Jesus is going to be the most important relationship you'll ever have. He will take you to levels. He will help you care for your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend. He will help you care for your parents better. Because as we grow up, we want to be independent and we want to know it better than they do. But they've lived it. That's why the wisdom of counsel is important. Go to somebody who's older than you, who's experienced life differently, and ask for that assistance. I ask anybody in, who's watching us, most everybody in this room is blessedly saved, if you haven't found Jesus, don't wait another day. Amen. Don't, don't wait for the next Christmas or ten Christmases from now to find him. He has work, work for you to do. He's willing for you to, to learn and to grow. He is waiting for you to make mistakes. It's okay. He's going to work with us. For those of you who haven't taken him into your heart, I ask you to bow your head, close your eyes, and just say a simple prayer. The simple prayer goes like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner. I believe you died for my sins. Right now, I turn from my sins and open the door of my heart and my life to you. I confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. I ask you to, to help change me, make me a better person, a better man, a better woman. Thank you for saving me. Amen. If you say that prayer, I ask you to open your Bibles, get a Bible, find yourself around other Christian believers. You'll find some of them are different. Some are not wholeheartedly bought in. Sometimes they are. When you get that one who is, who's willing to walk with you and talk with you and feed you the good word, the hope, the joy, those are the ones you stay with. The other ones you pray for and you work by them. But find a way to get a devotion. There are many of them in Bible apps. There's many of them in, in printed form. <clears throat> Excuse me. But also do your devotions with others if possible. If you're just doing it online and sharing the devotion, that's wonderful. But do it. So the more you're in the Word, the more you're talking to good Christian people, the more your life grows. The more you see things in a better way. God will surprise you. He surprises me every day. I know pastor gets surprised all the time because of what he thought about. But all of a sudden he's like, whoa, wait a second, that's real. I knew it was real, but it's like really here. I know that happens to me all the time. But he blesses us in ways we didn't expect. 
when you say something to someone that's the right thing that you didn't think twice about, it just came out of your mouth, it came from God. If you're not connected, you won't have that opportunity. He wants us to be connected. He's waiting for those of you who aren't. And he loves all of us who are, and he walks with us. Sometimes he has a gentle hand on our back, and we don't feel a nudge. Sometimes he pushes us down the steps and says, wake up! Hopefully he didn't break anything. But he wants you happy. He wants you with him, because he gives you all joy. There's nothing more important than Jesus. Working through him with God to change your life, to change other people's lives, and to become one with Him. In this Christmas season, in our parting prayer, we're going to pray for change. We're going to pray for forgiveness. We're going to ask the Lord to touch everyone in this room and everyone who's watching. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together today. Thank you for the opportunity to share your words, to share the book of the Bible both Old and New Testament, to show everyone that it's all the same. It's about you in the beginning, and it's about you as Jesus in the end. Lord, touch us in our hearts, change us every day, massage us, craft us, shape us. When we aren't doing what we're supposed to do, pick up the clay and splat it on the table and start all over again. We need you, Lord. The pain of the suffering of life is something that helps us grow. I ask everyone in this room to, to just delve deeper into their word with you, to, to open their Bibles more, free, more regularly, less frequently. Just go in and learn from it. Understand you, because you live in us as a spirit. It, it doesn't do anything for us to just say we believe. It, it means that we need to believe and do as you obey, obediently push us to do. Lord, we just come to you humbly as we depart today. I ask you to put a hedge of protection around everyone and continually help those that we prayed for earlier in the day. Lord, I ask all of this in the name of Jesus and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for everyone for being here. We are dismissed.